go. Mr. Marino, welcome to the show. Finally, we're on. Yeah, man. It's been a, I guess, a, a miss. You know, come to the show. I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. What's up? And then we just fall off for a few months. But, you know, the world's going crazy right now. You know, people are, we've got the coronavirus and the job thing. And just, you know, it's a little crazy. And being in Seattle, Bro. people are burning down buildings. <laughs> Dude, you're right in the thick of it. What's that like? Um, well, it's really, I personally don't really feel any type of way or feel in danger or anything. I feel like I can handle that. I um, experienced the 1992 LA riot. So it's not yes. really, you know, and coming up in those environments, you're just like, you know, it's, it's, it tends to miss you and mm. go on around you, but not happen to you anymore. You know mm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. I, um, I was, I, I got really interested in the 1992, the, the Rodney King riots. Um, Cause it was so, that was like the first time. And look, that was like a year before I was born, but <laughs> It was the <laughs> it was it was the first yeah. time where like you've got the video literally showing cops beating the fuck out of this dude, and then it's just like, and then I just remember that Ice Cube song. They were all found not guilty, not guilty, and I'm just like, yeah. Like, when I was really getting into that, I was like, how the fuck is that possible? You know, do you see like similarities? Yeah. Um, I do, I do. I I see like a uh, mob mentality. You see perfectly, like for example, when I was younger, I remember when the verdict got handed down. You know, and when you're that age, I had, I was a child. So you're mm. watching these ordinarily rational and reasonable adults that are responsible for taking care of you and your well being, And you don't know what's going on. And you're watching these people's faces and attitudes change. And you're like, what in the hell is going on? Cause you know, what's up with vibes, you know, you feel the energy and the energy was so thick and heavy. And you know, it's the same energy that's happening now. Mm. And these people, like I said, that are usually rational and responsible for your well-being are doing irrational, crazy things all around you. And it's a very scary, scary experience, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. I remember, yeah. It, it would have been, I think it would have been scary as well, like especially as a child, because you're so dependent on, you know, your parents and your peer group and your guardians and stuff. And like to see, you know, like it's hard to decipher between what's rational and what's not at that age. But when you see something like to your point about the energy, like the vibes good off, like that shouldn't have happened. And then now they're free to go. Like that must make you, it just would have made you feel super afraid. I reckon. Yeah. When, when the, it's like, when you see something abnormal happening, I mean, you're a child, but you know that tanks aren't rolling down the street. You know, that fires in the distance aren't normal. You know, you see your neighbor, with a freaking couch in his truck, you know what I'm saying? You're like, hmm, we have some questions about that. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, man, that, that experience was pretty wild. Honestly, maybe it was my age, but I felt like that was a lot more uh, intense and there was a lot, of, lot more um, like anger, like pointed intentional anger. Here, we have a lot of people that the police brutality and things don't affect. So the energy behind their action is, isn't going to be so heavy. And so, uh, I guess, how could I say this, uh, violent, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though there's, they're burning down cop cars or, uh, breaking things, the intention behind it just isn't the same when it's something that really affects you mm -hmm. as a person or a person of color, you know, you just mm -hmm. feel the difference. And what's funny about this is people keep asking me how I feel about this. And I even had someone on my Instagram give me a little bit of shit because I said, I understand why people would do this. And I understand why some of these uh, things are happening. Now that doesn't mean I agree. It doesn't mean that I think it's right, but me being on the other end of police brutality, many, many times being a person of color, I, I, I used to, I used to feel this way. I used to mm. wait for something like this to happen, you know, not just because of the police, just because of how you're treated in America. And I'm never one to complain. I've never complained about that type of shit, but I understand how deep this goes. And there's different, different levels of reaction to, I guess it, the more that it's affected you in your life, the bigger the reaction. Totally. Totally. Dude. Yeah. I, I think to your point, I think trying to understand um, the other side is the first step towards um, coming together. And, and 
you know, to your point, dude, like there, there would be people out there right now that are going, you know, these riots are fucking crazy. Like we need to have peaceful protests, like all this sort of stuff. But like the history of shit that's gone down towards, you know, people of color, black people that like, it's just so much. And, and you and I both know that there are individual egos and social egos and history has massive consequences. And part of like trauma work and inner healing and shadow work is like getting all that stuff out. And you can see that going on in the social ego, just these people that are just fed up, you know, it might not be because, you know, people on the conservative side, they might be asking questions like, well, you know, was, was this guy the acute um, thing, you know, was it like racially motivated, all this sort of stuff. People on the other side that are just going crazy, like, dude, who the fuck cares? We put up this for like 300 years, man. Like, just like, this is just the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back, you know? Yeah. I believe it's the straw that broke the camel's back, but also when you have all these other things that people are upset about, you know, I mean, the coronavirus and uh, the whole, yes. just everything that's going on in the world and people don't have jobs, so they have time, right? <laughs> they, people don't have anything to lose. Really, people are losing everything. So now it's like, what do I have to lose? Let me go ahead and handle this and maybe we can get some change because what this does is open the door to a lot of systemic change, not just uh, police, mm. you know, policies and things like that. And so I think people are, some people are using this as an excuse to, to, project their shadow out into the world and totally. about these things that they've been holding on to. And some of these people are, have legitimate reasons to uh, protest, not riot, even though some of them do, which is, I wouldn't say it's right, but you know, I don't think it's right to, to riot, you know, but I do think it's right to make the appropriate amount of noise based on your level of understanding of said brutality or, you know, wrongdoing. Mm, mm. yeah it's funny you cop shit for that on instagram man like i think i think that's a really reasoned position it's just like i'm not saying i'm like i'm doing my best to be on the fence so that i can sit higher up and see both sides you know so i'm not over mm -hmm. here and just beating my drum and i'm not over there beating my drum but it's weird mm -hmm. how but then you get someone that's like you know they're going through their own stuff as well and it's just like well you're wrong for sitting on the fence it's like what can you do <laughs> you can't win right Right, right. It's funny because I, I understand both sides of this, seriously, because what, what I came back with the guy on Instagram, I told him, I was like, if this was 15 years ago, I would have been right there doing the same thing, tearing shit mm. up, you know, mm. very capable of doing that. But the man that I've evolved into being knows that that's not appropriate for the life that I want to live and the way I choose to show up in the world current day. And I had to go on to explain that to him. He didn't respond because I know I just slapped him in the it. face <laughs> because he assumed that he knew my stance because of what I said. People assume by what you say, that's the whole story. Well, that's, there's a part that I didn't say because we're not talking about that. You know what I'm saying? So I had to uh, put it down and be like, hey, lucky that I'm the man I am today or I would be there doing the same thing because mm. I feel their pain. But then I understand the other side of, this whole thing, you know, the police side and the, the, the police that were uh, standing around and doing their, what they were doing and kind of the weight behind if they did do something, you know what I'm saying? Or not even the weight if they did something that they probably didn't feel that they needed to double check what this guy was doing because officers also trust other officers just like the public are supposed to trust officers. So why is this man going to second guess what he's doing when he's paying attention to the crowd and other things going on? And so I understand, like I said, I don't think it's right. I understand how someone could be distracted away from what's going on and not go, hey, why did you do something? Because I don't know if half the people haven't been in that combat situation or anything that's violent to that magnitude and they don't know what they would do. So I get it. Mm. Dude, I, I think you would actually have, I think your voice at the moment would be one of the few that is actually worth listening to, you know, like I, I would assume that people would see you, see you as a person of color and then just assume that you are on the, on, on the side of A, B and C, you know, and then you're, you're like, well, mm -hmm. hang on. I've, I've had an upbringing like this, you know, um, I've had to do things like this, A, B and C, and now I'm kind of moving into this new sphere. But the fact that you actually can see both sides is, um, 
I think it would be a voice worth listening to. Do you get people like that, that, you know, they're just like, they assume that this is how you think and yeah. What's that like? Okay. So I was on another podcast and, um, you know, they're, they're a pretty outrageous podcast. They're a fun group of people. I actually really like doing them. Um, but they came in there and framed it. And I don't think it was intentional. It was just, I mean, look at me. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not in denial about my outward appearance. I get it. I would assume <laughs> the same exact thing, right? I would assume the same thing, uh, whatever. But uh, they framed me. They said, well, since you support X group. Sure. And then I'll, and I go, I had to correct them. I go, hold on a second. I didn't say I supported this group, but I didn't say I didn't support this exactly. group either. I didn't say that though. I just said, I never said that I supported them. So they come into the situation with their mind made up that I support this group. And when it comes to these groups, you know, and supporting the police or whatever, the problem that I think people are having, it's an all or nothing thing. Totally I support yeah. some of the things that this group is doing. I support some of the things that other group is doing. There's no all or nothing here. We have to kind of have some balance and some understanding and some patience with the other side. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. Because it's, um, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the things, even from like a psychological context, starting to listen to the other side in your own head, you know, because that's the first, first um, step towards becoming more whole. I think it's just like, okay, I've been anxious for three years here rather than just like distracting myself with all these drugs and sniffing heaps of Coke and going out and partying heaps. I'm going to actually like, <laughs> sit back and like listen to what the fear is trying to tell me. And then I'm just going to try to work around this, you know? Yeah, exactly. 100%, man. I get it. Mm -hmm. Dude, I suppose we should um, give the listeners a um, brief intro as to who you are and what you do. And we could talk for hours, but um, yeah, go for it, man. Who is, uh, who is, how do you say your last name? Marino? Yeah, Marino. Mm -hmm. Marino, Marino. Yep. Who yeah, is Julian yeah. Marino? Yeah. What does he do? <laughs> well, I'm Jay Moreno, and I am a life coach. And um, let's see, I have my list of things that I do, but it, it gets so complex, so I have to, I guess, uh, distill it down to a few words. Um, I help men and women, I guess, because I, I really, when you go down to the core of it, it's masculine energy and feminine energy. It's not men and women, and I guess I do focus more on men because you know, it's masculinity mastered and you would assume that it was going to be for men. So I focus on men, but I help people understand, understand themselves and understand how to work with the things that they have. You know, I don't, I'm not a coach that focuses on changing you. I'm a coach that focuses on helping you work with what you have and readjust these fragments of yourself to better work for you instead mm. of trying to stop you from using what you have already, you know? Dude, I think that is why you and I connected so much. You know, we, we were starting to talk about masculinity from an esoteric life force sense, you know, and to your point about it's not men and women. It's so true. Like the, the force in itself, it's, it's the yang. It's the, it's the directional um, purpose-driven side of everything in the universe, you know, and I, I'm assuming, I, I remember us having this conversation, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk on it. I'm assuming that's probably one of the, really annoying boxes that you get put into would be like, Oh, he's just all about men, which is not even bad in and of itself, but like, it's just an annoying simplification of the work you would do. Right. I mean, that happens all the time. I get uh, feminists on the page and they're like, women can do this too. And I'm again, I didn't say that they couldn't, you know, you're assuming that I'm saying that women can't do this. I'm speaking of masculine energy, the forward moving things, you know, the things that men primarily embody, embrace and express outwardly. And I try to add uh, a little bit of feminine energy to that to kind of, you know, I guess, not like water it down or anything like that, but just create a little balance. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess that's what I do on that page. I try to create two different points of view so people can see kind of like where I stand with the whole uh, Black Lives Matter thing see both sides of these energies and try to figure out how they can best work together so that you can be the most productive man you can be in today's world because we have to learn how to iterate those two energies properly. And so that's what I'm really after underneath the 
you know, the whole man thing. It's like a human being thing. How do you show up as a human? You know, that's what mm. I'm about. Totally, dude. It, I mean, to me, masculinity is the, um, you know, the, the, the order side of things. And um, we live in a world now where we're more free than, than we've ever been. So it's like, what do we do with all that chaos? Like it's chaos that we've all, you know, fought hard for our ancestors and grandparents fought wars and things. And, um, you know, got us to this stage where we can actually now decide our struggle. Um, but it's like, how do we order that? Um, did you, did you come to that place um, yourself? Like, was there like me search involved before you decided to become a life coach? And well, okay. So I'll give you a little background on myself. Um, I'm pretty much every statistic that they speak about when it comes to what's missing from a man, you know, nowadays. Uh, I grew up with no father in the home. I didn't grow up with a mom. I was in foster homes. Uh, I guess I was back and forth between foster homes and my mom. So I got to see uh, a lot of different types of abuse because she was a drug addict and, you know, you know what comes with those lifestyles. And so there was a, I experienced a lot of different types of abuse. And when you come from those environments, you become severely fragmented as a human being. You don't, you know what I'm saying? And you lack mm. certain things that you're supposed to absorb at, at certain ages in your life that from a man and not having a father figure, the streets were my father and they taught me how to be tough and not having a mother figure I would find in different women. So I'm doing all these things that men are not supposed to do. Right. And, um, I ended up meeting a mentor of mine, his name, um, his name is Charles McIntyre and his best friend is a man named James Hillman. And I got to spend oh. time with a man named James Hillman and Chuck McIntyre. And those were my mentors and me still being fragmented and, you know, you're going to be more uh, aggressive and more street smart, you know, the, the side effects that come with that. When I met them and I spent so much time with them, it, it brought this balance to where these deficiencies became superpowers and you got to see the world in a different way that most people can't and it's not ruining your life because you become conscious of your consciousness and your ability to have the choice in life and mm -hmm. right away it wasn't absorbed but as i get older i see the breadcrumbs that were that put out there for me and i keep following them and following and i and it brings me to this place in a higher awareness of what the world not should be, but what it is. And I, I man, it, it's really complex for me to kind of try, try to put into words, but mm. I think the audience gets where I'm going with that, you know, and it was like an indirect thing. It was not intentional. It was just being around them. I learned things about myself unconsciously, you know, you know, I, man, that's, I really appreciate you for speaking on that, dude. That's really interesting. And I think, um, it's crazy that, that, that upbringing is so different to mine, you know, and it's just like, it's so cool to hear it because it's just like, Oh wow. You know, complete opposites. But to, to your point about having these mentors, I think one thing I really love that you just said is like becoming conscious of your own consciousness. And when you're, when you're able to be pulled out of the jar so you can read the label, it's kind of like, oh, wow, this is, this is what I'm doing. You know, this isn't how people live. I don't, I don't have to, you know, you became street smart as an effective survival strategy, you know? So it really, really mm -hmm. saved you. Um, and then being pulled out of that, you're like, wow, people live in a different way. Yeah, this goes up the list. It's so crazy, man. I've never actually spoken about it outwardly because it sounds so off the wall. But yeah, um, yeah right? And so... Um, he got with me and he was the only person that I would listen to in school. And so I had his class every day for, for years, years and years. And his, uh, his class was psychology. Right. And so when you have his class for six hours a day, because you don't listen to anybody else, you absorb everything that's going mm -hmm. on. And then we developed a personal relationship and it got deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's when it became more of a spiritual thing. And you look back and realize you're spending all this time with these men. James Tillman, he was doing his own. He wasn't there doing that, but they were best friends. So when they were around each other, I was there. Um, you look back and you realize what was happening, man. You were being integrated without knowing it. Totally. You know and yes. That's why you are the way you are. And you can see this balance in life and what works and what doesn't. And be fair about what you're seeing and, 
you know what I'm saying? It, it created mm -hmm. this me that you see today to where I can be super, I guess I can dig into the primitive side of myself because of the streets, but I also know how to vibrate a little higher and see, okay, this is what I'm looking at. And you can see a person as a person and see through their behavior, you know what I'm saying? And, and mm -hmm. really see the soul of a person, you know, and I, I mean, that sounds crazy, but I feel like they have allowed me to, to recognize what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing in, in a deeper way, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Dude, I, I'm chilling. I have the chills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's so crazy. And so I've almost, I feel like him as he was, he became my father figure unconsciously to me until I was in my like twenties. I realized it because I went back and found him because I just, I talk about him all the time. And when I do, people go, hey man, you're that to me. You're that to me all the time. They're that to me. And I was like, you know what? I want people to feel the way I feel about this person. I want to bring that same awareness and understanding to the world that these men provided for me. And so that's what pushed me into the work of uh, serving other people. And I really feel like that's my life's mission and my purpose. I know it is. There's no feeling like it is what it is because guys like me don't come in contact with men like this, you know? And so I'm trying to maximize everything and all my experiences. I want, at the end of the day, my, my purpose is to help men and women find meaning mm. because they have, they helped me find meaning in all the trauma, all the situations and tragedy that are in my life they all mean something now. And every time I touch somebody and speak to someone, that's the meaning. Mm, fuck man. That's awesome. And you know what? It's so cool that it's actually what is most meaningful, meaningful for you was what is simultaneously most painful for you. That process of finding the meaning, you know, and it, I, I doubt very much that when you're in that pain, you can say to someone, Hey man, this is going to be the best thing ever, you know? Cause it's like, what the fuck? Shut up. You know, <laughs> but, but looking back on it now, it, it's kind of that thing. It, it, it does almost become spiritual it becomes transcendent. Cause it's like, that isn't how it, like, how the hell did that turn around 180 like that? You know, man, it just, it gives I got goosebumps too, just talking about it. And it almost like chokes me up thinking about these men just because of, at the time you don't know what's happening to you and I, I doubt it was intentional with them me too but I mean maybe somewhat but man I just I couldn't imagine where I'd be as far as like my level of understanding of what the world is and understanding myself you know if, if it wasn't for these men that came into my life when they did you know it's it's pretty crazy it's just insane to think about at times man. Yeah. it's overwhelming sometimes yeah yeah Shit, dude. So how, so take us through the journey. So you've, you've met, you've, you literally have effectively grown up on the streets and you now meet these men, you know, forced to, of course, but then you, your, your eyes start to open and the veil begins to fall and becomes a little bit more transparent. Take us through that journey of like when you met them and you started spending time with them to, you know, to, to, to where you are now, like what were some of the breakthroughs and things you saw? Okay, so, all right, I'll be 100% honest. Um, it's funny, I can, you know how they say they don't have initiation for men and all these other things. Um, I remember the day I became a man. I really do, and it was because of him. He, um, I was talking to him, and I, uh, I had a warrant for my arrest. You know, it was for, um, like, driving and doing just dumb stuff. You know, I was still really young, and... Um, he came to me and he was like, Hey, he never told me what to do ever. Or, you know, whatever he said, you can do one or two things. Now this doesn't sound like initiation to somebody else, but where I'm from, it's like the first time you take ownership of yourself. And I did, um, he goes, you can do one or two things. You can go there and you can face the music, walk in there and turn yourself in, or you can stay running and they'll catch you eventually, but you can stay running. And I thought about it. And I went there the next day. I was scared. I wanted to cry. I didn't want to walk in there, man. I was like, what the hell? I didn't know. And uh, it was so scary. But then I did it. And I went through that few months of being like with all these grown ass men in there being a young kid. And at the time, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that I was changed and I saw the world different until I was in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And it really didn't unfold until I was like 33. 
that was the year, man, where it all just boom. I figured, I saw, I can look back and go, these people set the stage. And so if I wouldn't have took that direction that day, it wouldn't have set me on the path to uh, this awareness. And what happens is you keep hitting these milestones and you don't know you're on this journey. You look back and you go, oh man, this was a, this was a thing, but you don't connect it to them. You just go, wow, okay, this is turning out different. And so you keep going from stone to stone to stone. And you're like, man, I'm doing something right. And then I look back and I'm like, wow, they set out the breadcrumbs for me to follow. And ever since I've been doing that, you know? Mm. Oh, dude, I love that. Like the, fir the first thing that, that, that initiation for you was um, taking ownership and telling the truth. You know, it's, it sounds mm -hmm. so simple. It sounds so simple. And, um, you know, just to kind of juxtapose my story into it a little bit, won't talk about it too long, but it's um, to some degree, my getting my life in order, you know, I didn't come from, from such disadvantaged positions like you did, you know, um, which, which makes it, it's like, why don't you just fucking start telling the truth and taking more responsibility, you ad advantaged piece of shit. But like, for me, it was like little things like cleaning my room a little bit more and like, you know, when I was really young, I started to do the dishes, taking more ownership to, to your point, you know, little things like that. And eventually it just grows and grows and grows. And like the sail, you know, that the ship's going down this part. And then eventually you start doing a little bit, just be like, okay, I'm responsible for my life. Um, and then it just starts going that way. And then it's, it's almost annoying how simple it is, you know, to some degree, like I wish it was more complicated than I like. It's like, I found the gold. I found the message. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's funny when you come from the trauma and you are forced to grow up so fast, your, your, everything that you do is accelerated. And so it's not why it's not cleaning the dishes or doing things like that. It's going to go turn yourself into the police. It's, it's not, you know, beating the shit out of this guy. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's those kind of situations, but there's, when you think about it and you really break it down, there's no difference between choosing to wash the dishes and choosing not to stomp this dude's head. Mm. What's the difference? Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no difference. I mean, for you though, growing up on the streets, it's just, it just, it, it feels like if I'm putting myself in that position, there would just be so much more intensity because I can only imagine there would have been moments where it's like, okay, I'm going to take the moral high ground here. I'm going to take ownership in my life. And I'm not going to stomp this dude's head in. But then it's like, where do you draw the line between that kind of kill or be killed, very real situation? Because for, for, for many people, I imagine it's not just a matter of, um, well, I'm just going to not live here anymore. You know, that's what I don't like about that conservative argument of like, just make better decisions. Like, I understand your point about taking ownership and all that sort of stuff. But if you have literally been raised by the streets, you can talk about trauma as much as you want and all that sort of stuff. But like, dude, it's hard. It's so hard. It's impossible. It, sometimes it's impossible because it's not a matter of uh, choosing to be like, okay, I'm going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. You don't know what the right thing is because exactly. your environment, you don't like when you're going through things, you don't know that you're going through things. You don't know that it's, you know, that you're being abused. You don't know that the environment you're in is insane and other people don't go through it. You don't know. So the choice for someone to wash the dishes and show someone else choosing to, you know, walk away from a fight. It's almost that simple because it's common mm. and it's not that it's not that intense to you because it's something that you do and you're very good at doing and it happens, mm. you know, pretty frequently. So it's not really something you have to give too much thought to, you know, I mean, you do when you're, you're picking the right thing, but it's not, it's not that intense. Yes you know yes but it does come with a consequence though when you do do that you're leaving something in the world to come back and get you because when you come from the streets like that you are so close to being primitive man because that's where you live you're primitive you're surviving you're you will attack you know and uh coming in contact with those uh mentors allow me to make the choice and pull back and see human beings as human beings and you know see the ripple effect of your situation of your uh choices and it made, they made me a human and not just mm. a surviving animal, you know? And I wasn't like a crazy person or very angry and, and a random. It was very intentional with who you had problems with and the things that affected you, you know? So it wasn't like you're just some lunatic, 
but mm-hmm. you started seeing people no matter how bad they were as humans and that allows me right now to see people even like for example like the rioters and the police i can see them as human beings because of that that's totally. why i see both sides of it because they're humans and humans do human shit Mm, exactly exactly and and at the end of the day you know we're all um that's why i love studying um you know different religions because it's kind of like we're all just like trying to figure out what the fuck we're supposed to do (laughs) it's like i really love my family um i want to have a good life and we're all trying to figure that out except like because we're we're predicated in you know in these like socio-cultural norms our answers are like super super different you know, mm-hmm. and then eventually mm-hmm. you reach the extremes where it's like, well, you know, this is what I think. It's like, oh my God, I do not think like that. Get my AK. <laughs> right, right. Exactly, man. It, it's, man, it's just, it's wild. It's wild when you think about it all. Just the world's crazy. You're crazy. I'm crazy. It's I'm crazy. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dude, I've got a, um, I've got like a chest tattoo here. And I think it went for like four hours or something. Um, and it was the most painful experience. Like I've got some other tattoos and stuff, but the chest was the worst by far for me. So when you say that you're crazy because you've got this full on chest tattoo, I'm like, dude, you are definitely crazy. I just couldn't even imagine going nah. through that. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. It, it was painful, but not painful. It just was, mm. you know, it just, was i don't know how to explain that but it just my mind didn't go there mm. it just taking it in and just letting it happen like surrendering to the pain to where it's not really affecting you you know and so that was the experience for me and it almost sent me like out of body you know what i mean so it was pretty cool how long did it last like is it full is it full from peck to yeah peck? yeah it, it's oh yeah it connects from arm to arm peck to peck um and it goes down pretty far it took I think, I don't know if I went twice, but I remember there was like one four or five hour session. And then I think I went back for another couple hours, but uh, I would say like six, seven, eight hours, maybe at the most. Yeah. 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 So, it's, a, it's enough time to just like blast off into it. Cause that's one of the things about, um, you know, you read man's search for meaning and Alexander Solzhenitsyn and their yep, whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, their whole idea is around, finding meaning through um, intense suffering, like intense pain. And obviously that's going to change you. And it, it's so different when you embrace it. Cause some, cause obviously for those guys, you know, they found themselves in camps, concentration camps. And it was kind of like, well, I didn't ask for this. You know, I was just a writer. But then going through that and not eating for days and being tortured and watching all your friends and family, die, you know, we're obviously not suggesting that people do that, but they came out of it with this incredible new perspective on life, you know, did you, do you remember like a moment in your life where you kind of had to go through this kind of intense situation, whether it was pain or some sort of psychological thing. And you can look back on that now and go, wow, that really was a different me then, you know, countless times, countless times, because I mean, I come from extreme poverty and now I'm nowhere near it. And so I look back at that, but extreme poverty, extreme abuse and violence, Um, my household was basically like a camp and I'll tell you a little bit about this. My mom was with a man. Oh man. I, my mom was with a man and she used to chase men and stuff because she was in the drugs and, you know, prostitution, everything that comes. My mom was actually born in a brothel. That's a whole nother story. And so, um, she was with a man who was severely abusive financially, emotionally, physically, and me too. And, um, and he was racist. So I lived with, all of that and he was racist towards me right? and so it was continuously years of that experience yeah man it, i didn't realize how deeply the racism and the emotional abuse affected me until later on when it came to like the way i saw myself and the way yeah. i carried myself in the world and what i put out there yeah i didn't i didn't see it but when i did i got real pissed but totally you know i look back on that stuff now and i'm like holy shit because you don't know, like I said, you don't know when you're going through it. You know, you look back and you're like, wow, <clears throat> wow. And that's all you can say is wow. Mm. You know? And so, man, 
yeah. So anyway, <laughs> um, I actually forgot your original question because I, w- I went into that thought and I was trying to play it off like I can remember, but I don't remember. So go ahead and put, put me back on yeah. that. <laughs> no, but it's, I, th- I think that's a good, it's a, it's a good segue because that, that's one of the things I think I love about um, trauma information. You read the books like a lot of Bessel van der Kolk's research out there and Peter Levine's research. Um, mm-hmm. But to, to your point, it's just like, if someone's putting you down as a child for the way you look, it's just like something you literally can't help and in no way, shape or form means anything. <laughs> you grow up with this kind of, okay, there's something wrong with me, you know, and then that just mm-hmm. pounds and pounds into this kind of sense of unworthiness, you know, that's really, really hard to come from, come back from. And I think one of the um, alarming things about trauma or just, it's just really like, awareness provoking you know is that i think when people start the healing journey there's this sense of i want to no longer be triggered by things um eventually you reach a point of acceptance where it's like that might always trigger me you know because of because the traumatic experience happened i'll never be able to go back and change the past and if someone you know says oh you know you're black and then whatever and punches you and goes crazy on you how is that never not going to trigger you? And I think that's a really um, sad but mature place to come to when you're dealing with your own trauma, whether it's racism or whether it's abuse or, or, or whatever, you know? Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. People, it's always going to trigger you, you know what I mean? In some way, it's because it's trapped in your body, man. You know, it's trapped in there. And totally. It's just, you have to, you have to like with everything else, you have to have a plan for when it happens. You know, like one thing that I teach a lot of people is, like I said, I don't try to get them to change everything. I try to get them to put things in place for when it does happen. You know, even the things like cheating, it's like, yo, if you have a problem with women, know you have a problem with women and put things in place to stop you Mm -hmm. from going to that place. You know, when you're feeling yourself triggered, go ahead and allow yourself to go, yeah, I'm pretty triggered by that. And remember why, because sometimes Mm -hmm. there's certain things that happen in my past that I hang on to on purpose. You know, those things that you learn from the streets and all the trauma, people don't get that. And, and those things make you very, very powerful in the right situations because you see people. It's like you hear red pill, right? Oh, well, red pill, all this other stuff. My yeah. version of red pill is seeing behind that curtain, seeing who's pulling the levers, looking mm-hmm. behind people's masks because you've seen behind everybody's mask already, you know, and you don't want to take that from yourself. You want to use it, you know, and you want to use it in a, it might not always be a positive way or even a negative way, but it's something that you have in your back pocket that you don't want to lose. You know, it's most people don't have that. Dude, I love that. That's such a good point, you know, and you know, you said that before you said that in the very beginning of the show, it was like, I can see both sides. Um, you know, the rioters and the police a, because you know, you've come from that place of being in that poverty, you literally, I'm sure seen any, an experienced, I imagine police brutality and all that sort of stuff. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's fucking crazy. Um, and then the other side as well, it's just like, but now having distanced myself from that, you know, there's that, there's that quote, oh, I'm going to butcher the fuck out of this man, <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's that um, quote by Ram Dass. And he basically just says, it would be nice if we could all see each other as trees, you know, like when you go out into a forest and you see a tree that's bent or dying or whatever, you don't look at that tree and go, that's bad. You know, you say, Oh, that tree just didn't get enough sunlight here or it's in a shitty position in the forest or whatever, you know, and then we see really angry people or really sad people. We immediately, because this judging in a critic thing go, Oh, well, he's immature or he should be more responsible. Or can't we all just get along? And what are you doing? And it's like, well, you see behind the mask to your point about the red pill. It's like, I imagine, I really believe this, right? That if every single person was going through, like if you look at someone and then you, and you literally went through exactly what they went through, there is no question that you would do exactly what they're doing. Right. You know, and, and yeah, I like to think so most of the time, mm. you know, she would do what they do, but one thing that this trauma has allowed me to not even it's not this trauma actually no yeah the trauma and my mentors it allows me to see people's trauma and feel it because you've seen it and experienced most types of trauma you know it's insane but it developed this deep sense of empathy 
mm. to where you can see an angry person, a violently angry, dangerous person, and see why they feel that way and understand where the need is. It's just looking like, okay, I see what this person needs. And you can't just be like, this is what you need. People say, oh, don't tell people what they need. But it's like, yo, if you've been there, you've been there. You know what you're looking at. It takes one to know one. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And so it, it's allowed me to de develop this deep, deep, deep level of empathy for what you're seeing in the world. And when you know how to not let your tragedies and your uh, the abuse you face, when you don't take that out on other people, this is kind of a good thing and a bad thing. When you don't take that out on other people and you don't become a predator like that usually produces, the the backfire is, is you feel their pain instead of producing pain for people, you know? And so getting that energy in check has been a, a difficult thing. But yeah, I think we should see all, uh, each other's trees. <laughs> Just the same. So do I, dude. <laughs> you know, I'd be one of the hairy ones out there. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Hell yeah, man. I'm True. Sure. Yeah, I love that. Can you speak a bit more on that, man? That's um, that's such a good point. When you immediately don't um, defend, you know, you don't put the anger armor up. I think to some degree, that's like why we subconsciously put it up. So we don't feel the full force of this person's energy that's just crying out sometimes for need of a hug, you know, or need of like, hey, can you just listen to me? How can, like, what are some of the tools that you use for people to, um, you know, not barricade themselves behind those ego walls like if they, if they're doing it to their self like to open up a little bit more or to I think how, so, how, yeah. how I would speak to somebody how, how would i get them to open up to me i reckon that's a good one to start actually because a lot of people find it difficult to just open up to any coach or, or counselor you know right right well what i try to do when i'm trying to get someone to open up to me i try to understand the way they see the world Right. I, I ask questions, you know, and I start from there and I, we start going down because everything starts service level, you know, and you can't really communicate with somebody unless you really understand the way they see the world and try to understand how they got to seeing the world that way. And you go through your own experiences and your education and the things, you know, and you relate. And even if you don't relate, ex you know, directly, exactly. There's so many different universal principles in different situations that apply that you can just cross-reference the principles in all these situations and relate no matter what. These are never changing. These are ever changing principles that stand, we're standing the test of time. When you can tap into those and, and see those clearly, there's not many people you can't communicate with. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What was that like for you when you decided to become a coach, man? Did you start to, you know, when we throw ourselves into things like the learning curve, it just goes up straight away. It's like, oh shit, now I'm in the deep end, you know, should have brought the life jacket. Um, mm -hmm. What were those skills around like listening and learning and being able to, you know, because I imagine that would have improved heaps as the more you did this job. Um, well, it was, I hate to say it, but uh, not, okay, how can I say this? You might have to cut this out too. Yeah. Um, when it comes to coaches and coaching, those tools are very limited. And I feel like that the way I do what I do, maybe the steps and, and, and getting people to find their own answers, the way you like, you know, you ask questions, get them to walk there because mm -hmm. you know, the damn answers, you know, <laughs> maybe, you know, those have been, you know, you know what the hell you're looking at. And so you have to walk them there, but for the most part, those those tools god i don't know how to, i don't want to be uh disrespectful man um ask me that question one more time man one more yeah. time. i do know i do know what you're saying though because it's like what did i have to learn you know if anything you have to learn less and listen more like it's kind of like to, to your point i think that's a really good point when someone comes to you um asking for help um I think the stance you really want to take on is essentially just, okay, this person knows everything about themselves. I'm just probing them with questions so that they can unravel themselves. Right. Right. You know, they know themselves better than anything. So you have to know what questions to ask, but you know, it's, I don't ask those questions to figure out what they're, I guess, like when you speak to somebody, your counselor, you know, 
you got a good idea of what's going on when you start speaking to somebody. You're like, okay, you have a general idea and then you go from there, you use the tools and stuff, you know, but there's mm-hmm. those cases where you're just like, you knock it out of the park with two seconds of being around them, you know? And so it's, geez, it's, I draw a lot from my experience. That's mm-hmm. what I do. I draw from life experiences because pain is pain is pain is pain. And when someone comes to me for help, I can flip through the Rolodex of tragedy and trauma and not even just my own. I came up in foster homes. And when you're in foster homes, you see these people have just came from, because the foster homes I've been to are, were not the good ones where they care. I was at like a receiving home for a really long time. And that's when they're just coming in off the street, you know, and, cause they had a hard time placing me just, I don't know why, but um, you're getting them fresh from abuse, fresh from, what they've been going through so you now you're experiencing their pain coming through there and some of the times they're doing those things to you that happen to them you know and so when you're able to see these different personalities and different types of people and identify what's happened to them and what's happening with them and experiencing some of that with them by being around them it's very easy to see other people's pain and feel it you know and so that's where I draw a lot of where I come from you know and that's also where some that empathy comes from because you remember you know and you don't want, want anyone to experience that you know instead of taking it out on people you want to avoid that you know and that's mm-hmm. where I think a lot of my strength in this uh path that I've taken comes from is my own pain and the pain that other people have shared with me dude I, I absolutely agree with you I, and I think that you know no one would ask for an upbringing like that and, and childhood experiences but what it's given you, you know, if you, if you can like, for everyone listening, there's a few people to watch it, but most people listen to it. Um, if you can imagine like a, a spectrum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's got his tattoos out, guys. We should definitely watch it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fresh haircut. Good to go. Um, yeah, I'm looking fresh. <laughs> looking fresh. Much more fresh than me, man. I, th- I was looking before and I'm like, shit, I think I have like a red face. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Dude, I remember you had long hair. As soon as you cut your hair... I was like, what the fuck? What, what, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? You, you look, you know, okay, like, like myself, I look a certain way. I know what I look like. Okay, yeah. you're, you know, you're you, you know, woo woo. Let's, let's be real about that. You're, you're <laughs> that guy. You know, woo woo, you have hair. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're flowing, you're feeling good. You're flying on a cloud with your white linen pants, bro. You know what I'm saying? And then you cut your hair. Yeah. You know, I know. It's like, what the fuck? I'm back down on the ground. That's so true. It doesn't look yeah. right. You talk about spiritual things with a shaved head. <laughs> you, you're like, okay, cop. You know what I mean? You don't know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, you know, remember, we're all one. one. <laughs> yeah, we're all one. You know, it's funny. Uh, my appearance actually uh, hinders my growth at times when it comes to, uh, I guess, not my relatability, but trust in my knowledge. You know what I mean? Because I talk to a lot of regular people with, that don't come from my background. I actually really talk to a lot of people with the average background and that don't experience a level of trauma. And for some reason, that crowd tend to shy away from me at first. Like mm-hmm. my information can't be trusted or, you know, they let that outside image, you know, repel them. And uh, that's one challenge that I've actually faced when coming into this business. Mm-hmm. And I've actually been really insecure about that, you know, about uh, like on my Instagram, mm-hmm. you know, I try to be yes. a lot lighter and yes. a lot less intense. And recently I've started to accept that about myself. Like, okay, look, you're intense. You're an intense person. That's just how it is, man. And accepting that that's just the way it is has made things a lot easier and actually allows me to be a lot lighter and free feeling, man. It's pretty wild to just come into that and accept that, you know? Yeah. Pretty wild. But dude, I mean, I don't get that feeling from you at all. I don't feel, I feel like, I don't know, maybe because we're interested in the same things. I, I can see us. I could totally see us grabbing beers if we were living in the same area. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, I just, I can, I can see what you're saying though, man, because like people would be, oh my God, like he's learned all this because he's had an upbringing like this. A, I haven't had an upbringing, so how can I relate? B, there is that intensity because I don't have tattoos and all that sort of stuff. But the point that I was making before is like, you have experienced the pain and your consciousness is being expanded this far because of the shit you've gone through. So for someone coming at you with like a, a, a nihilistic position, anxiety that are 
dealing with in this realm. It's like, you've been to the fucking ends of the spectrum. Like you can help because your zone is so much wider than, than the zone they're dealing with. Obviously like all pain is relative and all that sort of stuff, but the tools that you have had to learn or else die dot, dot, mm-hmm. dot, you know, is like right. are applicable across industries. Right. Thank you. Exactly. They really are. They really are. They make you, when you can, when you can, uh, I guess, harness the power, you harness the attention and you can focus it on something meaningful and useful. It, it really puts this energy out into the world that really just cultivates real change, not this surface level, level bullshit, not this, you know, not to say anything about that, the surface level things need to be done. But a lot of time there's some deep work behind these things that people are lacking that most people can't get to. You have to be there to know it. 100%, 100%. Look, oh, the perfect example, right? Someone comes to you <clears throat> and says, I've got this really um, shitty boss, you know, she's an absolute tyrant. I, I, I don't know how to talk with her. Um, she, she's intimidating. She freaks me out, all this sort of stuff, right? You're telling me that having grown up where what you say is going to affect whether or not you're going to get shot doesn't make yeah. you an expert at conflict resolution. <laughs> expert, expert. You, you become an expert before, way back in the day, there was, for me, conflict resolution. <laughs> yeah, right. There is no conflict. <laughs> I'm the resolution. That's how I felt, you know, and like, that's not even to sound cool or be a tough guy. You know, it's funny, that kind of environment, you know how people hype being a tough guy and highlight that and, and celebrate that. There's nothing funny about people that do that shit. And I, that's how you mm. know a fake person from a real person. They know, mm. yo, that shit ain't, that ain't cool, you know, mm. but uh, off of that, um, yeah, you become an expert at uh, de-escalation. Yes. And you bring it down, you bring it down. And then when you have this awareness, flip the mirror on them. That's what you're allowed to do. You take it and you go, she's here, Ah, mask on. She comes down, the mask starts to split. Now flip the mirror in her face. Make her think about her thinking and why she thinks it. Yeah, that's, uh, she won't be at work the next day. (laughs) She might not, and she might, uh, you know, she might re-examine her whole, the way of being and you know and it's crazy i've actually been told that they're like man you've really made me re-examine just my whole way of being and my way of uh existing and thinking and i'm like wow that wasn't the intention i was trying to call you a low-key bitch without saying it you know what i'm saying (laughs) (laughs) totally totally but you're totally right and 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 from that perspective like it's a good thing like de-escalation you know when we're talking about like ego clashing with ego it's um on one level it sucks because you're like squashing your ego and, you know, having to accept and acquiesce and all these sort of things. But if you, if you're deescalating, you actually help them grow as well, because we know, you know, that behind the anger and the intimidation is, is pain. And like, what could be better yeah. than, you know, polishing the mirror, as you say, like flipping the switch and helping them with their pain. It's like, Hey, you don't need to attack me like that. Yeah. I'm coming from a place of love for you to come from a place of love is going to mean integrating yeah. some of the parts that have been left behind. Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy. When you come from a place of not even, I guess it could be love, but I come when I, if I was faced with someone like that, I would first look at it from a place of understanding. Mm. How did you get to this feeling and why do you feel it needs to be expressed this way? Right. And this doesn't take long. It takes, you know, a couple of seconds, you know, a couple mm. minutes to just talk to them, you know, and when they see that they, that you see them yes. and you recognize them as a human being, and then you, you start to listen, you're seen and heard. Everyone just wants to be seen and heard. And when you can express those things, they, they calm down, they become human and they see you as human. And then they want to communicate with you like a human with no mask. Cause that mask mm-hmm. is because they feel like they're not being seen. And, you know, the bigger the mask, the more people think you see, but you don't, you know? And so mm-hmm. when you, when you allow that, you have to allow the space for these people who are aggressive, upset, or sad to express these things to you by that understanding and seeing and hearing them. You know, man, one of the things I love about this show is that more often than not, 
it ends up coming full circle towards the end of it. And I, I think what you said there is a brilliant piece of advice for people that might not understand the whole riding situation. And, you know, never in this podcast have you and I said that looting and hurting people is the way to go, but there are people out there that are really um, offended or um, fearful of the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, people like really screaming and shouting and all that sort of stuff. What you just said there is a perfect example, I think, of, of what needs to happen. Like to, to listen means to bring all that. You want to talk about masculinity and, and femininity, you know, these forces, creating space and, and holding that space for someone whilst they let the hundreds of years of anger and, and, and pain and torment out. It's like you might get a little bit hurt along the way, like the fire is going to burn and it's going to create some ripples and shit on the bricks, you know, but eventually we're all going to be able to grow. Like it's just, it's just that whole movement is just like for once, like finally just let me say what has been in my DNA for like generations and generations. You know, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm yeah. just going to scream and shout, you know, and then it's like now we can come and, and because you've listened, because I've had a chance to vent, you know, um, now we can grow together. Right, right. And, you know, I think one thing that we lack is fairness. Be fair. Be fair. You know what I mean? Acknowledge certain things. Be realistic about it. I mean, I think that goes for men and women, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we have this whole uh, debate on, uh, uh, what is it, male privilege, white privilege, black well, all these privileges and, and shit like that. And we mm -hmm. know these things all exist. Who cares? Be fair about it, though. You know, I'm not saying mm. be fair and adjust your life. Be fair and be like, yep, it should happen sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Women have privilege too. It's like, yeah, it happens sometimes. Be fair about it and stop trying to fight it and try to understand it and live, live with it or adjust it a little bit. But fairness on both sides is going to have to happen for any kind of movement, you know? And so totally. I think that's a big thing that we're missing is fairness. And I think that comes with being a man, you know, because people go, okay, what? what that what you're doing has to do with masculinity besides the fact that you put a man in front of your your memes it's like well everything everything's the same everything's the same you know what i mean there's no difference between anything we're all it's all the same mm. the, the same energies exist in the world like when we were talking uh last week you go man that tree growing over there is masculinity yeah. it's forward moving it's growing and you know serious it's like everything is the same mm. There's no difference. So everything that I say applies to masculine energy. It applies to feminine energy, you know, and the things that I do post on that page, if you really examine what I'm really saying, you know, like when you don't mind if I talk about my page for a second, right? No, go for it, dude. Of course. Okay. This is your out. show. <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, they ask me, you know, I get a lot of people that misinterpret what I'm saying. And this is what I do. I let the picture draw out your bias of what you think you're seeing, right? And then I'll say some sort of, I'll say something, but I'm not, not saying the other part of it, right? And so I also let your bias assume you know what I'm saying. You think you know what you're seeing, you think you know what I'm saying, and then you read my caption and I slap you in your face with, oh shit, you know what I'm saying? And so I try to expose people's biases like that and kind of make people rethink their thought process and what they think they're seeing and hearing. You know, and everything that's in there, usually in my captions, is some fair, rational, very well-balanced, energy-wise uh, explanation of what I really mean. And so that's where I think I bring together that masculine and feminine energy in a very uh, balanced and fair way. Mm, mm. Yeah, uh, dude, that's one of the reasons why I love you so much, mate, is because Thank you, I think you Thank do. You. I think you do a very, very fair it's very fair. It's, um, it's unbiased. And because it's not fair and unbiased, it's true. It's true. It's true. You know, it, it is the Taoists, you know, with yin and yang thousand years ago, figured out that this whole universe operates on a perfectly balanced playing field. And you're one of those people out there. Um, and unfortunately in your space, there are lots of people that aren't doing it. Cause like, well, men need to fucking step up and reclaim. It's like, so much ego in that, you know, it's not even yeah. about that. It's yeah. not even about men. <laughs> no, no. It's funny because uh, another reason for the page is a lot of men don't know how to do that. Like for myself coming from these backgrounds, you know, the trauma and the abuse, those things that I post 
on that page, like, okay, integrity and all these things that men are supposed to have, whatever the fuck, that does not come naturally to me. That, because that wasn't instilled in me. That wasn't a thing. That wasn't something to be thought about. There was a word that you tell people to shut the fuck up. You know, those are words you tell people to get people to trust you, you know, and there came a point in my life where I figured out that those things were missing and those things are actually required to, um, I guess, exist in the space that we're in nowadays because you can't go around with this, this absence of uh, morals and values mm. and think that you're going to thrive in today's world. I mean, you can, but if, if you want to vibrate down there, that's not really going to work out. You know, that's, it's going to be a, a bad place. You're going to stay in the same place. And so what my page is when I do write things and post things, these are things that I have to choose. I have to choose integrity. I have to choose honesty. I have to choose to show up. You know, I have to choose to have this balanced dynamic in my relationship and respect and, and, and love a certain way, you know, and sometimes when I'm posting, not always, but sometimes when I'm posting is a reminder, hey, man, that is the man that you are. And that's the man you're going to be. And that's how you show up. So, you know, that page is, is me, you know, and how I deal with all the trauma and the things I've been through is reminding myself. And sometimes I've had a lot of people communicate with me telling me that my page has changed their life and their aspect, you know, their, their, uh, their, what the hell perspective on life. You know, people are on the brink of suicide or there's so many different DMS. It, it kind of gets scary sometimes, but to know that something that I chose that day intentionally helps somebody else, it keeps it going. You know, I don't care about, well, I guess I do care about the likes and follows. And the reason is all those people are alive. All yes. those people are individual. They are all alive and you get to touch their life and be a part of their journey in that way. And so when I pick and choose who I'm going to be that day intentionally, that's what I want to put out into the world, you know, or that's what I'm thinking about. Like I posted a post today. I said, your dick isn't your friend, basically. <laughs> so right? And that's because I've ruined so many relationships, bro. I have ruined so many relationships and I saw my mom cheat on everybody she's been with and I've seen how things work and I'm like I thought it this morning I was like yep your dick's not your friend and then I decided to put that down there because it's useful you yeah. know and so I'm very intentional with a lot of what I post and it just it's a way of putting my a little bit of my soul and myself out there for someone to learn from and to mm. hopefully grow from mm. it's it's really real man I, I I really appreciate the work you're doing and um I know this won't be the last podcast we do. Um, no, absolutely not. We'll, we'll keep riding on this wave, I think. Um, and um, I think like, like last time, last week we spoke to, it would be so cool to see more of you on that page. You know, I think, I think yeah. now, um, and just even as examples of podcasts, you have so many truth bombs to talk about. Like I said, I think you're, you're the one page out of the many out there that are really speaking of masculinity in the way that it should be spoken about not as this kind of like shadow ego trying to clutch it really outdated ways um mm -hmm. so i think like your voice is really important during this time man so i want to see more of it yeah i appreciate that man that, that really uh it, it kind of gives it more meaning like yeah yeah you know it's it's pretty cool um one thing one other thing yeah um that macho part of things that alpha male way of being also, I, I like to like highlight that that is necessary. That mm -hmm. is a very, very, very necessary part of existing and being a man. And that, you know, that's uh, saved my life many a times and got me through a lot of things, you know, but having that under control, harnessing yes. that energy properly and, and knowing when uh, to apply the proper amount of that way of being to said situation, it's what's going to help men the most incorporating all these things together is the only way that we're, we're going to continue to exist in a way that I, in a way we were meant to exist. You know? Totally dude. I love it. I, um, I, I, um, well, before the virus was loving jujitsu. And, um, <laughs> one thing I really love about that is like, you see the white belts come in, I being a white belt and, um, <laughs> first couple of sessions you go in there and you just try to like, go crazy, you know, and I used to play footy and I've been a weightlifter and a CrossFit coach and all that sort of stuff. So I was like, okay, I've got a little mm -hmm. bit here. The black belts are just full meditated, dude. Like they are calmer than we are talking right now. And they just beat you up. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. you're going to put your hand there? All right, you're out, tapped. <laughs> That's so funny. That's how it is like on the street when you know you got hands. 
you don't say shit. You're not talking shit. You're chilling and you're, you're, you're studying your opponent. Yes. You know what I mean? You're studying your opponent. You're watching. You're like, oh, there's his weakness or the loud mouth in the party. You're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna whoop his ass. You know, stuff <laughs> exactly. like that. It's, you're, you're calm. You're still. So, you know, I get it. Sort of. <laughs> yes, exactly. There's still a part. It's just like, oh, I'll take this guy. <laughs> Right, right, right. So, yeah, man, this is the only podcast. Actually, you're one of the few people that um, I feel like understand the real message because I get a lot of a lot of shit because people think that I'm not staying on what the page is about or what I'm saying. And I'm like, no, you're just not thinking deep enough about mm. what I'm saying. You're not, you're not, you're not <clears throat> listening. You're not feeling what I'm saying. You're comparing this shit to other pages that have to do with men. And that's, you know, go carry something heavy and, you know, uh, create some balance there, man. It's okay to love and be vulnerable. It's okay to be cool, but you keep that gun in your back pocket if you need to and be willing to use it if you have to. That's the masculinity part. You need control. Exactly. It comes down to how you choose to live your life and you shouldn't, you know, be the playboy and for, for women as well, like be the playgirl and play the field or whatever, unless you want to. And then also, no, I put a post up a couple of weeks ago about this. It's like, you just, just that consciousness to your point around it. It's like, you want to go and play the field, know that the field's playing you too. But if you right. want to do yeah, that, yep. go, go for it. You know, that's fine. Yeah. It's your life. Yep. You're going to cause yourself a lot of problems though. I played the field for a long time, especially not having a healthy, I know we're going over, sorry. Um, nah. I'm especially uh, watching all these unhealthy relationships. My mom cheated on everybody. You don't know how to be in a committed monogamous relationship because you've never seen one and absence of a, of a, a maternal figure and, you know, you're not nur nurtured, you tend to try to find that in women and playing the field and being out there. And you think that's what love is because you've seen that's how love is expressed. You know, so I guess there's different reasons for men that do those kind of things, but mine comes from a deeper uh, mm. void that I was trying to fill throughout my life. So, I mean, I get it. And I think, I mean, I think I, that I thrive really greatly in that, that part of what I do is uh, relationships and it's pretty wild, man. So yeah, there's different reasons. And I think people, men should do that at one point in their life. You should get out there and do as much as that as possible because you don't want to do that shit when you're 35 and you have something to lose. Yes. Do it when you're 19, you know what I mean? So. Kiss a few frogs, find out who the princess is, who the prince is. Totally. Ah, just kiss, kiss a bunch of frogs, man. Fuck it. No one's going to know, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Except the frogs. <laughs> right, yeah, right, sure. man. So so oh, yeah, I, um, I, I honestly do. I hope, um, you know, for, for all those people that see your page and assume things um, that, you know, this is give you an opportunity, not that you even need to explain yourself because you don't, you know, we're all just living our lives the way we want to live. But, you know, if those people can now listen to the show and go, that's what his message is, which I think is obvious in your page anyway. That's why we connected. <laughs> but right, for people that right. need to listen to the show that for some reason need to find that out. Um, yeah, man. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it definitely won't be the last. Oh, no, no. This was a great, man. I, I, got, I have that feeling, man. I just, it's been a while since I felt uh, connected to anybody or on this, on this level of uh, understanding. So I uh, thank you for creating the space for me to uh, express these things to you and deliver these messages to all your listeners. Thank you guys for listening. Come visit me at masculinity underscore mastered on instagram yes. feel free to say hello dm me we can talk whatever you know i'm there i'm there to help mm, mm, absolutely yeah absolutely guys um please check your stuff out boy girl frog cat whatever you know I think it's a, <laughs> tree 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 exactly exactly <laughs> um you know these are inherent forces within all of us and the more we can understand ourselves the better so guys thanks for listening